All right, everyone, I did it. I read the meme book. Here we go. Donald Trump, The Art of the Deal. Now this one, the beginning about quarter of the book caught me by surprise, and I almost didn't stick with it. I'm just gonna read off some of a text that I sent to a friend about it before I actually finished getting through that part. The structure of this book is actually really interesting. I'm intrigued by his choice of how to lay it out, though I find the actual content to be more bland than I expected. In the intro, he says, there's no typical week in my life, and then most of the book so far has been basically reading off from his personal meeting journal. The time he started talking to X person and what they talked about, and some backstory for his relationship with that person, and his general impression of them, maybe an anecdote about them or something. And then, 10.46 a.m., I make a phone call to whoever, one after another for entire days and weeks of his life. It's all mildly interesting, but not absolutely gripping. I get the feeling he chose this way of writing it because he just didn't know how else to convey his mentality and mindset when he approaches business deals. Just watch and learn without even having a way to explain the underlying mechanics of it. He puts the responsibility on the reader to intuitively flow on the same rhythm and become worthy of being his apprentice. I wonder if I should put this one away and pick up a different one of his books before I come back to it. Now, when I wrote that, I was actually humorously close to the end of chapter one, which is basically pretty much what I said, that one after another, day after day, listing off his meeting schedule. Now, that style of writing does come to an end after a time. A surprisingly long time, actually. Chapter two of the book is where he actually writes down the underlying mechanics of how he approaches business deals. And then, interestingly enough, chapter three is almost entirely about his father, and then following that, the entire second half of the book is just an overview of his most career-making deals up to that point. I believe this book was published in the late 80s. And then at the very end, he puts some quick blurbs about how all the deals from the first chapter of the book have been sorted out. It's been interesting to get through. Like I said, I'm intrigued by his choice of structure for how to lay out this narrative. But I think it did all come together nicely, and it gives a nice picture of his mindset, how he approaches life, his outlook on life. Side note, I just saw a news story this week from the Stormy Daniels trial. One of his former aides was giving testimony about the way he would write his tweets. He would actually compose them out loud, like he would verbally dictate the tweet to an aide and give very specific instructions about punctuation, capitalization, stuff like that spelling, and I just couldn't help but burst into laughter when I saw that because it was one of those, like, New York City courtroom sketches of, like, a crying woman on the witness stand, and the headline to that was, he liked to use the Oxford comma, so I was just, I, that just made my day, just crying about the Oxford comma. I loved that. That tickled me. I sure feel sorry for whoever ghost wrote this book, but that tickled me. So I'll read off a few of the notes I made for his chapter two, the one where he goes into the mechanics of how he approaches deals, and also some philosophical points as well. First up, most people who have a natural talent for deals never discover that talent, and even the smartest person in the world can't be trained to make deals if they don't have that natural talent. I actually think this is a really great piggyback off of something I talked about in the Christian Science book review by Mark Twain. Twain wrote something to the effect of people have a certain nature, each individual has their own nature, it might lie dormant for a long, long time, they might even never get an opportunity to discover that part of themselves, but it's always going to be there. If you're ambitious, for example, or if you're greedy, for example, it's always going to be a part of you. You can't just remove it. And Trump seems to believe something very similar. He believes you can be a great baker or a great architect. You could be top of your class, the smartest mathematician in the world, but if you don't have that, I'll call it a natural spark for deal making, then it's just not going to work. You can try your hand all day at doing what Trump does, but if you ever go on The Apprentice Show, you're going to get fired. Next up, uh, he talks about the importance of flexibility. He Always keep my options open is the way he words it. And I wasn't as surprised at how much he just goes with the flow in what he does, but I think it would be natural for some people to be surprised at that. Gives examples of stock market shares he's bought or properties he's bought where, yes, he has a plan for it, but there's also a plan B or a plan C, or if something changes, he could do something just on a whim, totally unexpected. Like, oh, if I don't get the right zoning or licensing for this property, I could, could always flip it, or I could always turn it into a condo instead. If he meets a roadblock, there's always a plan B. 
and if he doesn't have a plan B, he can think of one on the spot. Something he's proud of is he always does his own canvassing. He never trusts ad firms, meaning that the companies that go send someone out to scout an area, tell you how things are on the ground. If you're thinking of buying a property, what's the neighborhood like? What are people who live around there talking about? What are the local things that you should be aware of? He writes that he relies very much on his gut feelings. And he gives an example of just how taking a ride in a taxi and having a quick conversation with a taxi driver is worth so much more than the most detailed, in-depth report from a third party who went out there if you don't actually have your own feet and eyes on the ground. And it's not just with canvassing going through the book where he lists off details about all his career-making deals. There are several examples where he just had a good gut feeling about it and went with it or had a bad gut feeling about it, and oh, he's, he was right, it's good that he got out. He just trusts his gut a lot more than most people would be comfortable with. Another thing, haha, <laughs> very relevant for the 2016 election, a one-column news story is worth more than $40,000 in advertising. And if you lived through 2016, yeah, you, you saw Trump use this in action. He knew just how to play the press, just how to say things in a way that they're forced to report on it because it's going to get front page attention, but then there's no real way to avoid talking about the aspect of it that Trump wants talked about. I forget if this example was 2016 or 2020. It was the story in the 15 minute news cycle was something about, oh, Trump believes this conspiracy theory about Obama's birth certificate. So he announced that he was going to do a press conference at the Mar-a-Lago where he would give an update on his view of Obama's birth certificate. So the day of the press conference comes, he says, hey, look at the Mar-a-Lago, look at how magnificent, gives a campaign update, lists off all the good things about his campaign, and then at the very end, five-minute blurb, oh yeah, um, Obama was born in America. And that's it, and all the news corporations were forced to report on that because they already had people there streaming it live to all the cable news channels. Trump absolutely knows how to play the news to his advantage. Always go for the best, never settle for less. This mentality helped Trump a lot when he was building his luxury apartments in NYC. And he goes into this concept by giving the example of someone selling a car. He can tell the person is a hack if the car is dirty in any way, and he talks about how easy it is to just clean up the car, and then you could get hundreds of dollars more on that deal, or sometimes thousands, just by the car looking clean. And he absolutely takes that mentality with his apartments. Everything needs to be spotless, and in a future part of the book, he actually gets into a dispute he had with the co-owner of a building. They were saying that they should cut down the maintenance costs by doing polishing of marble statues less often and stuff like that. And Trump said, no, absolutely not. And in the end, he ended up buying out his partner's share of the building and continuing doing the maintenance the way he insisted on doing it. And it's a luxury apartment. If they cleaned the lobby less often... Somehow I think people would notice, and also somehow I think it would be a slippery slope to cutting more costs and cutting more costs, and sooner or later it would have no longer been a luxury apartment if they went along with that. So from a business standpoint, I think Trump made the right move there. Never go into a deal without leverage. That one's pretty self-explanatory. Always prepare for the worst, and the best will take care of itself. He explains that if he's okay with the worst case scenario, then anything better than that that happens, that's just icing on the cake. And finally, he says something that's strikingly similar to, if you've ever read Fountainhead, the final, the final speech that Howard Rourke gives in the courtroom. This quote seems to be lifted right out of that speech. He's talking about people who would rather be critics than make a career out of something productive. If they had any talent at all, they wouldn't be building a career out of standing in other people's way. I love how much that quote just bleeds Ayn Rand. On to chapters 3 and 4 where Trump talks about his upbringing and a lot about his father. He says he was a very aggressive and assertive kid, no surprises there. He says his family are his closest friends, and that makes a lot of sense from the way we've seen him operate, both in business and as president of the U.S. He talks a lot about his dad and the lessons he learned from his dad about work ethic. Talks about how his dad was a slumlord in New York, but could never quite afford the more expensive properties. He stayed with low-budget housing, but in building it, he had an intimate knowledge of the construction process so that he wouldn't ever let a contractor fleece him on the price or talk him into a last-minute addition that wasn't really necessary or say that there was an unforeseen complication but it's actually just BS to try and get the price up. He admired how his father knew all those aspects of the trades, 
such that he could negotiate the initial contract low, but not lower than the contractor would need to make a profit, and he could see through and make a good decision every time a contractor approached him and tried to add an additional cost to the contract. And Trump very much kept up with that throughout his life. Even types of construction or types of management even that he wasn't familiar with, he was able to quickly learn it. And because of that new knowledge and new skill set, every item he learned just made him a more effective builder and a more effective businessman. Also talked about how his father was able to really keep the contractors in line, stay on top of construction projects, have a very visible presence on construction sites, and the result was he was always able to build better and faster than the competitor. And that's something else Trump kept up with throughout his life. He took a very hands-on approach when dealing with construction sites for buildings that he would own. Trump wrote that his father could run circles around all college-educated people. Nevertheless, he respected them probably because he couldn't afford to go to college himself. But observing that in his childhood stuck with Trump throughout his life, and it made him realize that people with a some fancy PhD they're just human. They're not some superhuman. With the right knowledge and the right skill set and the right temperament, Trump could run circles around those people too. And very often he does. And these two chapters, I think, just go to show the very high opinion that Trump has for his father. Next up, we get into the section of the book where Trump talks about, basically in chronological order, the big deals he's had through his life. The first one he talks about, but I have a feeling this wasn't his first big deal where he made a name in business and construction, but the first one he talks about was the New York City Convention Center project, and he goes into detail about the different locations that people were advocating for, and Trump pushed very hard to get the specific location that he thought would be best. And in the end, the city went with the location that Trump wanted, but they didn't let Trump have a hand in the construction. The next day he talks about was the Commodore Hotel project. He goes into detail. The Penn Central Hotel was selling the property, and Trump took a pretty big risk buying it and converting it into a Hyatt Hotel tore down the building, rebuilt it. But before they could do that, they he describes a really big catch-22 they had where they were going for a tax break that was held over from the 1975 New York City economic crash where the city wanted to give really big tax incentives to people who build new projects in the city because of how much business left after that crash. So they were going for that tax break, but there was some confusion because they also needed to guarantee a loan from a bank financing for that. All the banks they talked to didn't want to finance it until they were guaranteed that tax break, but then the city office didn't want to guarantee them that tax break until they saw that they already had funding for the project. So he describes going back and forth and how that was eventually settled. Also describes the importance of a non-compete clause that he had with the hotel chain that was managing the hotel on Trump's property. Even going so far as to say he wrote a part in his will about the importance of that non-compete clause so that whoever takes over his business would realize it's not something to get rid of lightly. And he writes about how every so often some guy from this company, the Hyatt Hotel Company, would come around, Hey, Donald, how have you been? I'd love to meet up for lunch. Not interested in letting you build another hotel. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Well, have a good day. I'll talk to you later. <laughs> That's a little funny. And in the process of making, I forget if it was the Hyatt Hotel deal or something different. I wrote this note down, but I didn't make it clear to myself which story it was a part of. But Trump was struck by a man named Walter Hoving, who he had a verbal agreement with this guy. They shook hands on it. And then he said, hey, uh, conditions might change. Could we get something in writing? And Hoving ended up looking genuinely distressed that Trump would think he would go back on a promise after a handshake. And Trump believed and Trump thought that expression was genuine. And he goes on to describe how later on conditions did change, but Hoving stuck to what he shook hands on, even against the advice of his lawyers. And Trump really admired that and illustrated how much of a contrast it was between other big-name businessmen in the city and Walter Hoving. The Trump Tower apartments are where we really get to see in action how much Trump values the appearance of things, and how much effort Trump puts into getting the aesthetics just perfect. He goes into detail with how much effort he put into constructing those apartments and 
how to give the appearance of being an exclusive, prestigious thing. He would purposely tell people that the apartment building was full, they had a wait list, whenever a rich person would come and try to get an apartment. And he talks about at one point a competitor opened up in the same area, and they were all holding their breath seeing if the competitor would actually be a threat to the business, but then the competitor announced that their price for apartments was lower than the Trump Tower price, and the people Trump worked with thought initially thought that it was a bad thing, but Trump said, no, no, this is great. By setting their price lower than mine, they're essentially admitting that they're not as good as me. And Trump used that image. He's not just selling a building, he's selling an image, he's selling prestige. Trump understands this, and he knows how to leverage this to customers. And he even talks about one time there was a rumor. I don't think this actually happened, but it was just a rumor that Princess Diana had, from England, had bought one of the Trump Tower apartments. So this one news reporter calls him up, Hey, uh, we heard that Princess Diana bought a Trump Tower apartment. Oh, I can't confirm or deny that. He doesn't deny it. He says he can't confirm or deny, which fuels the media speculating about it. And apparently they also called Buckingham Palace and they gave the same answer. Oh, we can't confirm or deny that. And I'm pretty sure the reality was no, but Trump purposely said can't confirm or deny because he wanted that prestige of people thinking, hey, British royalty might live here. He talks about how he got into the Atlantic City, New Jersey casino market. He talks about hearing a news story about how Hilton Hotels was having a strike in one of their Las Vegas locations, and how that single strike was making their stock price actually go down a significant amount, and that confused him because he knew how many locations Hilton had. He looked into it, turns out over 150 locations, but as he found, 40% of Hilton's profit at the time came from their two, one, two, two casino locations, and those casino locations were having employee strikes, and that's what was causing the stock price to fall so much. So Trump scratched his chin, he said, hmm, casinos make a big profit, don't they? So he started looking at Atlantic City, New Jersey, which at the time was a pretty rundown city, but they were considering legalization of gambling. So Trump kept his eye on it, but he decided to wait because as soon as they legalized gambling, of course, everyone who wanted to build a casino would rush straight there. And the prices for land, prices for development would go up right away for a little while, but then they would stabilize, and after they stabilized, after he could buy property for a lower price, that's when Trump planned to move in. And that's basically what he did. As far as his opinion on gambling, he, it might be a surprise to you, Trump doesn't have any problem with gambling. Shocking, I know. But he actually writes, the New York Stock Exchange is the biggest casino in the world. And yeah, that's true. <laughs> like, I... Speaking personally, I myself have dabbled in crypto a little bit, I've dabbled in stocks a little bit. I'm always aware of the rule, never put in more money than you're willing to lose, and yeah, that's good advice because I'm I'm not the smartest person in the world with that. I've lost actually most of the money that I've put into crypto. Well, actually my crypto's been doing a little better. My stocks, I've lost almost all the money I put into to the stock exchange. So Trump talks about eventually after he gets in and he buys property in Atlantic City, he talks about the common mistake that other builders make is they start construction before they get their actual casino license. So they're halfway through construction and some city inspector comes in, oh, uh, this, this room, it has too many rooms or too few rooms, or this needs to be wider, this doorway, or something like that, and then they have to change up their plans after they've already laid the foundation and put up walls. So Trump specifically avoided that and waited until he got the final approval before he broke ground on it. And as he's in the process of constructing the casino, he talks about how he doesn't yet have experience managing a casino. Most of his experience is in hotels. So he feels the need to search around for an experienced casino manager. And right around that time, he talks about how Holiday Inn actually approached him with an offer to both manage and finance his construction project. And of course, he played up to them like he didn't really need a partner in this project, but of course, he took the deal, and through working with Holiday Inn, he learned the ins and outs of managing casinos, which was very good for his financial future. After Trump's Holiday Inn casino was constructed, he talks about watching Baron Hilton of Hilton Hotels buy up land for a casino, and he makes the same mistake a lot of people made. He started building it, before he had all the licensing and zoning approved. So he has this building 
late in the construction process, almost ready, and then he gets the news that his license for operating a casino was denied. And Trump talks about a phone call he made to Baron Hilton, consoling him, saying, oh, hey, sorry, this didn't work out for you. Trump did write a lot about Hilton's children, though, and the way they managed the Hilton business. He very much believes that inherited wealth destroys moral character. And I think this is kind of funny, he refers to it as the Lucky Sperm Club. One aside I will make in between two of Trump's stories about deals he made is Trump speaks very highly of female hotel managers that he's hired, either his wife or another female that knows business, knows management, knows how to get stuff done. Speaks highly of women who are just tough personalities, strong-willed, they know how to get what they want. And I mention this because I've heard the theory going around that Trump's VP pick in 2024 will be either a soft-spoken male that blends into the background, or a strong, charismatic female. And from reading this book, I think that's very plausible. I think that fits in with his personality quite well. I wouldn't be surprised if Trump picks a woman for VP, not even because he's going after female voters, but because he genuinely enjoys working with strong-willed women who don't get pushed around. One of Trump's stories that I was actually pretty amused by is 100 Central Park South, and he opens it up by saying, the lower the rent and the fancier the apartment, the harder people will fight to keep their apartment because they have more to lose. And this reminded me of something I vaguely remember. I tried to look up the quote. It's from The Art of War by Sun Tzu. I vaguely remember him talking about, because I read it years ago, I might be misremembering, but I thought I remembered him talking about never back your enemy into a corner where their troops cannot retreat because then their troops will fight three times as hard because they're fighting for their lives. And in turn, it might not always be a bad thing if your army is backed into a corner where they can't retreat for the same reason. He talks about buying the apartment building from someone who was retiring and looking to get out of the business, so he got a pretty good price for it, and he didn't exactly suspect the reason for why the price was so low. Turns out it is a rent control building. And what rent control was is a government policy to lock in the amount of rent that tenants are paying so the rent doesn't go up an exorbitant amount. But the problem with that is it doesn't account for inflation. So at some point years down the road, the tenants are paying super low rent, but the building upkeep has gone up. The price of maintaining the building has gone up. So at some point, it's just impossible to make a profit on these buildings. And Trump even describes how a lot of buildings in New York City were just abandoned because the owners of those apartment buildings would rather not even deal with it. So Trump's plan when he went into 100 Central Park South was, of course, to demolish the building and build more luxurious apartments on top of that. But what he didn't account for are the existing tenants. They know they're getting the deal of a lifetime on those apartments that are already there. They organized, they fought it in court, the eviction notices and the planned demolition of the building. And Trump talks about a lot of tactics that other landlords would or could employ. Talks about the option of just purposely leaving the water heater in disrepair or moving homeless people and drug addicts into apartments that are already vacated, stuff like that. Trump did not do that. Instead, he was very hospitable to the tenants. He writes about a lot of effort he took to keep the building in working order for those tenants, but nevertheless, one of their tactics that they chose to use was to bombard him with harassment charges, which ultimately amounted to nothing. But Trump says in the end it was an unexpected win for him because they delayed him so many years in demolishing that building. In the meantime, the real estate prices in the city rose, so whatever he chose to do with that property suddenly became more valuable than what it would have been a few years ago if he had been able to demolish the building in a timely manner. Something else fun Trump did was he bought a football team. Not an NFL football team, but a team in a league called the American Football League, AFL, also known as USFL, bought a New Jersey team. Now, the team was known for being bottom of the bucket. They were, had a pretty bad record. Trump's plan was to reform both the team and the entire league so that the league itself could rival the NFL and the team could start being a much better profit on Trump's investment. So Trump gets in there. He starts going to the meetings of all the team owners. He starts proposing things like moving the football season schedule to the fall instead of the spring and encouraging all the owners of all the teams to start hiring out some of the star NFL players buying their contracts, names like Herschel Walker and Joe Namath, doing things that just really get under the skin of the NFL. 
And it got to the point where the NFL, the higher-ups there, pretty much internally agreed to declare war on the USFL, pressuring all the TV networks to deny them that fall-time season slot. This eventually culminated with the USFL launching an antitrust lawsuit against the NFL, which they actually did win, but the damages were, if I remember right, they only got one dollar in damages. And eventually the USFL actually merged with the NFL, something I never knew about. <laughs> So I would say Trump made out pretty good from that. A story that he put closer to the end is the second to last story Trump tells in this book, actually. And I think this one actually is my favorite. Wallman Skating Rink in New York City, Central Park. Trump owned a property that overlooks this skating rink, and he noticed for a number of years it was in construction, out of commission. The city was having a lot of setbacks with trying to renovate and repair this ice skating rink. So Trump decides, hey, I don't know anything about building skating rinks, but I can learn. I think New York City needs a big skating rink, so I want to offer to do this for the city. So Trump writes a letter to the mayor offering to build the skating rink free of charge, and the mayor makes a pretty significant political miscalculation. He actually publishes the letter that Trump wrote him along with a nasty reply that he sent back to Trump. I'm gonna give a few direct quotes from the book. First off, the press thrives on confrontation. They also love stories about extremes, whether they're giant successes or terrible failures." End quote. Another quote, If there's one thing I've learned from dealing with politicians over the years, it's that the only thing guaranteed to force them into action is the press, or more specifically, fear of the press. You can apply all kinds of pressure, make all sorts of pleas and threats, contribute large sums of money to their campaigns, and generally it gets you nothing. But raise the possibility of bad press even in an obscure publication and most politicians will jump. Bad press translates into potential lost votes, and if a politician loses enough votes, he won't get reelected. If that happens, he might have to go out and take a 9 to 5 job. That's the last thing most politicians want to do. And another quote, Bullies may act tough, but they're really closet cowards. The only people bullies push around are the ones they know they can beat. Confront a strong, confident person, and he'll fight back harder than ever. Confront a bully, and he will fold like a deck of cards. So the mayor published those two letters back and forth to and from Trump, misread the room, got absolutely slammed in the press, and basically his hand was forced. He had to let Trump take over the project. So Trump gets in there, starts learning about the project, finds out they were using a Freon system, which at the time was a newer technology, using a Freon system to freeze the ice. Now where things started going wrong was, it was a city-managed project moving slowly. The copper Freon pipes, the fragile copper Freon pipes, were not only exposed to the elements for a period of months, but it turns out people were breaking into the construction site after hours and trying to steal some of the copper from the pipes. Nevertheless, they persisted, um, they sure did persist. They persisted in pouring concrete over those pipes. Later found out that there were several leakages in the pipes because, of course. So what did they do to these fragile pipes that were poured underneath concrete? Well, they took jackhammers to the concrete so that they could access the pipes and repair the leaks. So Trump takes his first tour of the location, sees this, and, like, what do you think is gonna happen? As soon as you take jackhammers to it, the pipes are gonna break even more. So Trump sees this and immediately tells them they need to just scrap the existing construction and start over. He finds a guy from, I believe it was from Canada, that knows a lot about building skating rinks, gets him in there, refuse the two options for the kind of system that they could use to freeze the ice. The first was a Freon system, which was the newer one. The other one was a brine system, which uses salt water going through the pipes. I forget in the end which one they went with. Something else he put in there, this is actually one of the biggest skating rinks in the country. It is three quarters of an acre, which actually sounds pretty impressive. I do have plans to visit this at some point. Just because of everything Trump wrote about it, I want to see how it turned out firsthand. I want to see this. Uh, during the construction, there was actually a lot of news coverage about it, and the news crews kept bugging Trump with questions, bugging him for updates. He actually decided to give a press conference where he basically just said, yeah, everything's going according to schedule. And then the very next day, he gets all these positive stories about the skating rink construction. And even Trump said, yeah, that was probably 
a pretty showy move, but he was just getting bugged so much by the press, it was the most convenient way to answer all their questions. And this story in particular, just having spent time in New York City, having seen, having seen the malaise that just permeates every single New York City office, pretty much. Like something as simple as going to a doctor, the billing department, the amount of bureaucratic red tape, you're gonna get contradictory statements about your balance due, for months after your appointment, even if you pay it right away promptly. There's just such a level of so many people not caring enough about the quality of their work in that city. And then we get one man, Donald Trump, who's able to just build all this great stuff. And I think there's an inspirational story in there somewhere. I think there's a point to be made about having one person who cares, who really cares, and who puts a lot of effort in to do a good job, even in a place where no one else cares, one person who really works and gets good results can just do so much good for a place. And towards the end of the Woolman Rink section, Trump, in his writing, he analyzes, sort of autopsies what the city did wrong. He acknowledges, yes, they have this and that regulation, they can't move as fast, their hands are tied in certain ways. They can't be as efficient as private contractors for these reasons, because of these regulations. But a bigger problem than that, he says, is the lack of leadership. People don't stay on top of those builders and contractors the way that Trump does, the way that Trump learned to do from his father. And furthermore, there's a lack of accountability, and in some cases even rewarding failure. He gives an example of a guy that did a terrible job on a construction project. Beforehand, he made a show of saying, oh, if this, if this project is a flop, I'm going to resign. And he kept his word. He resigned. But then shortly after, he got a new position that was higher up with a little better pay, rewarding failure, people not being accountable for doing bad work. And from what I've seen of the city, that, yeah, that's, that perfectly describes New York City. Not just city government offices, but so many, so many private businesses. There are people who care but there are so, so many people who just don't care about the end result. They don't care about the customer. They're just in it for however many hours a week and a paycheck. That's the story of New York City. The last story Trump gives in his book was a property called West Side Yards. He bought it from a guy named McCree, who was initially a bridge builder from Argentina. Uh, Trump said that this guy did really good work building bridges, but that didn't necessarily translate well to building apartment buildings in New York City. For a number of reasons, what Trump said about this guy's mindset is he inferred he was used to getting all the funding and all the resources up front, and he was sort of blindsided by all the concessions and all the changes that the city demanded in the permitting and rezoning process. He didn't keep on top of his budget. He paid a lot of things in full before even selling the apartments that he planned to build. And he didn't do a lot of advertising work for his apartments. So sooner or later, he ran out of money, and Trump happened to be the one that bought the property from him. Now, Trump's plan for this place was to build fewer buildings, but also taller buildings. Mostly apartments, but also, like Trump Tower, he wanted to have a big retail space on the ground floor. And somewhere along the line, he decided he wanted to build the tallest skyscraper in the world. Acknowledging that for a variety of reasons, both construction reasons and permitting reasons, it would be much cheaper to build three 50-story buildings than one 150-story building. But again, remember what he said about the prestige value of Trump Tower. He firmly believed that the prestige value was worth it. He gives a quote that he saw from a news publication at the time. The quote is, Donald Trump is not being reasonable. But then, man does not live by reason alone, fortunately. Trump, who believes that excess can be a virtue, is as American as Manhattan's skyline, which expresses the Republic's erupting energies. The super skyscraper is necessary because it is unnecessary. And I think, especially for its time, in the decade of the 1980s contrasting with the Soviet Union, I think that is an extremely American quote about an extremely American city and an extremely American developer. That just hits so many beautiful, patriotic feelings in that one quote. And something else. When Trump announced he was going to build the tallest building in the world, he tells a story that he turned on the news that night he was expecting to see news about a meeting between Reagan and Gorbachev, but instead the news guy said, okay, we have to interrupt this broadcast, we have news 
Uh, the tallest skyscraper in the world has just been announced. So that even caught Trump off guard by how much the news ate up this story about the tallest building in the world. And he goes on a tangent about the city's policies that are driving big corporations out of the city. And specifically, he blames Mayor Ed Cook, who was actually the same mayor who published those nasty letters about woman skating rink. This was after the skating rink, after the big press conference that made Trump look golden and made the mayor look like a big buffoon. So that mayor absolutely had a bone to pick about Trump. But the issue at hand was NBC, the news broadcasting station, had announced that they would be moving locations. And one of their big options for a new location was in New Jersey, outside of New York City. But the other option was Trump's super skyscraper that he was going to build. And there was debate and city red tape that they had to cut through regarding the tax benefits to NBC for staying in the city. And actually, as a matter of fact, I do not know how that got resolved. I, I'll have to look that up, actually, because I believe that was still ongoing at the time that the book was finished. Okay, yeah, so I did look it up, and it turns out there were seven whole years of negotiations before all the zoning and all the plans got finalized. The plans went through multiple stages of changes during this. The 150-foot skyscraper idea was scrapped, and the current site as it was built looks much different from that original plan. I'm sure Trump found a way to make money off that, though. Following that, there's a short segment at the end that just describes how things developed, the things we heard about during that chapter one section where he just goes over his planner for that week. Among the things he mentions were he was invited to Moscow to build a hotel there. The Soviets invited him to take a tour around and consider land development there. So that would have been pretty cool, but I, I don't know if that actually happened. And the very end section where he ties the whole book together... It's pretty short and sweet, so I'm just going to read off four different quotes that actually I'm pretty sure they comprise more than half of that section. It's so concise. First one, I said at the start that I do it to do it, but in the end, you're measured not by how much you undertake, but by how much you finally accomplish. And that's, that's certainly a tough philosophy to live by. In a way, it takes the humanity out of yourself and reduces yourself down to the things that you do. And you're measuring yourself by your success or your failure, not by not by your spirit or your soul. But at the same time, you can't deny that Trump did accomplish a whole lot more than any regular person can ever hope to accomplish. He developed all these buildings, built a real estate empire, multi-multi-millionaire, president of the United States, and he's probably going to be the second president ever to have two non-consecutive terms in office. It's hard to think of a person who's accomplished more than that ever in history. Another quote, I've never been terribly interested in why people give because their motivation is rarely what it seems to be, and it's almost never pure altruism. To me, what matters is the doing, and giving time is far more valuable than just giving money, end quote. Another quote, the biggest challenge I see over the next 20 years is to figure out some creative ways to give back some of what I've gotten. I don't just mean money, although that's part of it. It's easy to be generous when you've got a lot, and anyone who does should be. But what I admire most are people who put themselves directly on the line. One of the challenges ahead is how to use my skills as successfully in the service of others as I've done up to now on my own behalf. Now that quote both echoes Andrew Carnegie, actually. Philanthropist, founder of Carnegie Hall, extremely wealthy individual who wrote that People with wealth have a moral duty to give back to society. But then it also foreshadows everything he's done in politics. He could have retired in absolute luxury, but instead, where is he? Right now he's in court because he made enemies out of the wrong politicians. And now all of his enemies who have political influence, they want to use every legal leverage they can against him. He could have just chosen not to run in 2016. He could be sitting around with his family in his pool, playing golf all day. If he wanted to, he could probably have more mistresses than Hugh Hefner. But no, instead, he's on the campaign trail, he's sitting in court, he's dealing with all that. And you may not agree with his political views, but I think it's plain to see that he's doing it because he believes he's doing the right thing. He believes what he's doing is improving the country. And I happen to agree with a lot of his political views, so there we go. Final quote, what's next? Fortunately, I don't know the answer, because that would take half the fun out of it. End quote. Well, at the time of writing, I don't think he did know that he would be running for president, but I'm sure he's having a lot of fun. This was an interesting book to get through. I'm glad I did it. Let me know if you like my review. Catch you later.